the virtual Marxist library. And um, my name is Gene Rule. Uh, I'm a member of this small collective of volunteers that put this program on. And I've been trying to get people to call me the general secretary because I do the mailings and make the coffee. Uh, but uh, there's some reluctance to do that. But um, uh, I still do the mailings and I have to make only my own coffee. But uh, while everyone else is getting their coffee, let me fill you in a little bit on the uh, history and mission of uh, both the, uh, of the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. And uh, our library was uh, named in memory of two very remarkable individuals, Carl Nebel and Roscoe Proctor, whose book collections formed the core of what became the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library for Social Research. Uh, Karl Niebuhr was a noted Marxist economist um, in Germany, which he had to flee um, with the rise of the Nazi Germany. And he uh, came to the United States. He served in the New Deal and in the US Navy during World War II. He survived the anti-communist hysteria of the McCarthy era and ended up teaching and becoming a full professor at San Jose State University in the early 1970s. When he passed away in uh, 1985, he asked that his collection um, be made uh, available to, uh, for research and that it be named for his wife, Elizabeth Hale Nebel, who was a leader in public housing during the New Deal. Roscoe uh, Proctor was born in Texas and moved to California in the 1940s. He had a long career as a farm laborer, longshoreman with the ILWU, and community organizer in Oakland, working with black youth in Oakland and South Berkeley. He was a member of the Communist Party's um, political committee and served as secretary of its trade union department. So uh, his collection along with that of Roscoe uh, Proctor was moved to uh, first the um, Finn Hall in Berkeley, and then to our present location um, at uh, 6105 Telegraph Avenue, which we hope to occupy uh, soon. We no longer accept book collections, but we can make references for it. Uh, we still have some issues uh, renovating our library. Um, and since the founding, uh, the library has served as a research center and as a community center, providing affordable meeting space for diverse uh, community groups and continuing Roscoe's work with youth. Now about the early part of the 21st century, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library, icssmarx.org, was formed to further uh, the library's goals of um, preserving our written heritage as well as supporting emerging struggles for social and gender equality and for socialism. The members of ICSS are active in different aspects of people's struggles in the Bay Area and globally. Some of us belong to, to specific political parties and tendencies, others do not. We respect one, other, one another, but do not necessarily agree on all issues. And so that the things that are discussed here do not necessarily form a, a group consensus. And I would just want to like to mention the recent article in the New York Times about Adolf Reed and the discussion, or actually the attempt to censor him uh, because he, wanted to, he was a black scholar that wanted to talk about class rather than a uh, race. And apparently the local DSA, not here, but in New York, had issues with that. So uh, we would like to invite him. I think he'd be an excellent speaker for us. But um, I will say that we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been in the past. And as a group, we continue to draw um, inspiration from the work of Karl Marx, including or especially 
his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. And as we all know, um, to in change the world, we have to understand it. And uh, we're all very concerned about the uh, COVID-19 and we need to understand it better. And with that, we're, well, we're very pleased to have Georgi Martinoff. And I'll turn it back to Alan, who will, I think, provide the introductions and carry us forward. Thank you. Sure. And uh, Mehmet, if you want to say just a few words about the, this part of the segment, how things will be handled in terms of audio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Al. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that there are some, sometimes people forget and their microphones are turned on, so we get uh, interference from background noises and things. So everybody that's joining the session is going to be muted and uh, you cannot unmute yourself. We have the chat available if you want to communicate with uh, either one of us or with uh, other members who are, who are in, the, in the session. So when we get to the q and I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves because it takes a long time for us to unmute you so, uh, so that we can have a nice session. Uh, if there are any other issues, uh, please uh, send something on the, send a message on the chat to me or Alan or Raj and we'll try to solve it if we can. But apart from that, we're looking forward for the presentation. Terrific. Yeah, so if anything comes up, the chat is available and Mehmet in particular will be monitoring that. Uh, we're going to start off with a presentation from Georgi and that will go up to an hour and then we'll have a short break and then we'll have question and answer from the audience. So let me begin just with a short introduction. Um, I first saw uh, Georgi's article uh, I think it was back in May, and um, immediately it struck me how um, he had tied together a lot of very useful information about the science of the, of the pandemic with uh, the political economy of what's going on as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I passed the article along to a few people, and what I started to see was what you might describe as, I hate to use the word, but viral uh, impact of the article in terms of uh, people were reading it. One of my friends who doesn't, uh, is usually pretty resistant to reading articles said that he started reading it and couldn't put it down until he finished it from front to back. And it's been uh, widely distributed and uh, uh, praised uh, among people on the left for exactly uh, what we just talked about. Um, I can also uh, say that uh, Georgi has been prescient about what's taking place today. A lot of the things that he was talking about, the spikes, uh, the, the impact of shutdowns and, re and early reopenings, all of these things are, are in his article, which was written back in, uh, I guess it was in April or May. And so he's really was able to get ahead of everything that's going on and has a lot of insights about it. So um, Yuri is a um, postdoc researcher in the genetics department at Stanford University. He is a geneticist and an evolutionary biologist. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll turn it over to him and uh, hopefully everybody can see his slides. Are the slides up, Mehmet? Are we okay on the slides? Can people see it? Yes. I, th I think so, yes. It's on. Oh, okay. It's up. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, Georgi, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay, so let's start. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Georgi, uh, if you can please uh, 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 turn the uh, camera a little bit down so we can see your... Oh, further down. Okay. So, I can't see myself right now, so that's why... Uh, like oh, this? Uh, uh, that's, that's better. Much better. Thank okay, you. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, um, yeah, so thank you very much for the opportunity uh, and the invitation, um, and um, I'm gonna start. Um, so, um, oops, uh, yeah, so just a brief outline. So first, um, I'm going to spend some time, maybe half of the talk, talking about the scientific aspects of the virus and the pandemic. 
uh, and plus a little bit of political aspects. Uh, and then second half, I'll talk about the failure of containment, what happened and what socioeconomic um, factors um, determine that outcome. Uh, and then in the, part, in the last part, I'll talk about just the larger context of humanity's historical trajectory because it actually ties to it quite in a quite significant way. So uh, I'll begin with the with science. Um, so first thing is uh, the virus itself. Um, uh, and this is really the second iteration of SARS, as we will, as we discuss in, in a minute. Uh, so first, first thing about coronaviruses. So coronaviruses, it's actually a, it's a very very large family of, uh, of viruses, uh, which belong to the Nidovirales order in the general classification of viruses. And this, this shows only a small um, portion of the diversity of, of the non-diversity of coronaviruses and I, in China, there's probably a database with tens of thousands of other such sequences that they have been collected. C43 seems to be the oldest one, and um, there's a theory that it actually caused the 1819 flu pandemic. So there was one at the time, or it might have appeared earlier, so we don't really know, but it seems to be the oldest one. Then we have 229E, which was discovered in the 1960s, or so certainly jumped earlier, but maybe it hasn't been with us for, for a very long time. And then we had NL63 and HKU1. Uh, and HKU1, you know, the name stands for Hong Kong. So these, these are actually discovered very recently, 2004, 2005, and seem to have um, probably have jumped fairly recently. Um, so there has always been this transfer of viruses, you know, from um, primarily from bats, you know, towards humans, you know, of coronaviruses. Uh, it appears that this is the case. But, uh, Again, these are relatively harmless. So then in 2003, SARS appeared. And SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, as at this point everyone knows. It actually caused the, caused the near worldwide uh, epidemic. So all of these countries had cases, and the countries in, in black uh, also registered deaths. So it spread quite widely. Um, so 29 countries, uh, it, it came from bats, as many of the coronaviruses. Uh, and there were in total about 8,000 infected people and 10% of them died. So it was a very serious disease. Um, you know, people, and it presents with many of the symptoms of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, but generally in a more severe form because um, um, more of the people died. Uh, but the good news was that uh, there were no asymptomatic or presymptomatic cases there. So everyone who got it got sick pretty quickly uh, and developed fever and could be, could be screened by just measuring temperature and they could be isolated and this helped with the containment. So as, as a result, uh, the outbreak was contained in 2003 uh, and then there were some sporadic cases in China that emerged in 2000, late 2003, 2004 and then it was over. So SARS disappeared uh, and that was it. So that was great. Uh, then uh, MERS appeared. So disappeared, which stands for Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome. And as the name suggests, uh, it's associated with Middle Eastern countries. Um, and this one appeared in 2012. And um, since then, it has uh, been appearing sporadically in the Middle East. It also caused a um, larger scale outbreak in South Korea in 2015 with nearly 200 people. And this one is actually even worse than SARS. So the, uh, about 25, 30% of people who contracted die. And it's a very bad disease. Uh, but uh, it's uh, also even more difficult to transmit. So it seems to be that um, um, so there is some transmission from human to human, but it's uh, actually just being repeat repeatedly introduced into our population. Uh, it seems to be from camels in the Middle East. So people get from camels repeatedly. Uh, so it was MERS. Uh, and now, so now, so now so remember, so we, have, so we have common codes, and, and this one maybe came in the 19th century. This one maybe came somewhere in the middle of the 20th century. These ones came 2004, 2005. This was 2003, and this was 2012. Uh, so, you know, so these viruses have been repeatedly jumping and uh, more and more of them were jumping onto humans over the last 20 years. So it was actually um, inevitable that there would be more of them in the future um, because, um, you know, we keep encroaching onto bad populations and um, there's more and more contact with them. So it was inevitable. And eventually SARS-2 SARS came, came around late 2019. And um, just as a brief, overview of what the virus actually is um, and no need to go into details but it's uh, 
uh, it's an RNA virus, uh, which has uh, a genome of around 30 Q bases. And it codes for, codes for all these proteins. Um, most of them, people don't really pay attention to, even though they actually play a very important role in terms of interaction with the, with the cell. You know, all these NSPs, you know, they um, interact with the um, translation machinery of the, of the cell, they inhibit the immune response, things like that. But uh, the protein that has uh, attracted the most attention is the spike protein. And so this, this is like the, the virus um, as a cartoon itself. So it has the it has a capsid, which is so this is the capsid protein, and it has these spikes, uh, which are on the surface of the virus, and there's the name, and this is the spike protein. And the spike protein is important uh, because that's how the the cell gets into cells. So it attaches to the ACE2 receptor, which many of you have probably heard quite a bit about over the last few months, uh, which is found on a wide variety of cells in the human body. Then there's a protease, which is necessary for the cleavage and activation of the uh, of the spike protein, and then the protein gets to the cell. Okay, uh, and this is another cartoon, same thing. So, uh, so the spike, uh, then the protein gets to cleave the the spike, uh, and then then gets in. So now the catch is that um, uh, the more efficiently the the protein, the spike protein is cleaved, the more effective the virus is. And something that people picked up from the very beginning of the uh, of the COVID uh, epidemic is that the new virus um, has an insertion of around four, of four amino acids right here that's not present in, in the previous SARS. And it's called the polybasic cleavage site. Uh, and um, uh, so long story short, this actually enhances significantly the cleavage of, um, of the spike protein and is thought to be the reason why the virus is so much more effect, effective than, um, than previous versions of um, similar viruses. Um, so this seems to be like the key difference that confers the properties of effectivity. Okay. Um, and, and, and the virus has the following characteristics. First, it has a broad tropism, which means that uh, it's capable of attacking a wide variety of cell types and, and organs. So, um, so the main, symptom everyone thinks about is uh, respiratory failure I and mean, because that's how people present. Uh, but over the last eight months, there's been abundant evidence that it actually, uh, it infects the, the kidneys, it infects the, the, um, the, the heart, it infects liver, it infects, infects uh, causes neurological damage and so on. Uh, and because it has this broad tropism, so whatever you have ACE2 in, 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 um, in the body, it can infect the cells and, and do damage. It's much more infectious than SARS-1 and MERS in terms of human to human transmissibility. Uh, and the most painful thing is that it um, spreads asymptomatically and presymptomatically, uh, which is good for the people who are asymptomatic, but it's bad for everyone else because it's much more difficult to contain. So uh, measuring temperature and things like that doesn't, doesn't work. And fortunately it has a lower mortality and it could have been higher, uh, which we discuss uh, more um, later. And it was, I think that I talked about in, in the article, but I'm, I'm gonna mention briefly here too, is that names matter. So uh, when it was discovered initially, it was called 2019 novel coronavirus, coronavirus or 2019 NCOV. It wasn't called SARS-2, even though that's exactly what it is. So this is the file 3 uh, and this is the first SARS virus from 2003, and this is the new virus, and you know they are fairly closely related, uh, and much more closely related to each other than say MERS and HQ and so on. But it wasn't called SARS-2, it was called uh, something else. And, uh, you know, for everyone who remembered the SARS epidemic, and I remembered it, and many other people did too, you know, so everyone knew, you know, this is SARS-2. And the Chinese doctors were also alarmed by uh, what was presented to them as a SARS-like illness. So it shouldn't be named SARS-2, and maybe then the world would have reacted differently because, uh, you know, SARS was um, striking fear in people's hearts for many years, you know, after the original epidemic, but it wasn't called that. And even when they officially named it in February, it was called COVID-19, not SARS-2. And I think that played a significant role in just downplaying the severity of the situation. Um, obviously it wasn't a main factor, but it was one of the factors. So how bad is it really? So um, first thing, let's um, need to clarify a few terms um, that are thrown around a lot in the media and the literature right now. So we have something called the IFR. And even in my article, I kind of confused the two with, um, because I was, I was most talking about CFR there. But um, so we have an IFR and a, and a CFR. And the IFR is the incidence fatality ratio, which means how many of those who are infected 
are going to die. And then we have the case fatality ratio, which is how many of the cases will die. And in a case is someone who has been diagnosed, well, which is different from someone who has been infected because it's a subset of those. Uh, because um, if you have asymptomatic spread, then you have cases that you are not diagnosing and that makes the um, estimation of the IFR uh, much more difficult than when you have no asymptomatic. And initially in China, uh, they estimated the following. So about 50% of people were fully asymptomatic, about 15% were hospitalized and about 3.5% died. Uh, and there were also random sampling studies uh, in Guangzhou, I think in like January, they did that. They tested a few, uh, a few test thousands of people randomly um, during the exponential phase of the epidemic there. And, and that's where, I, um, it was, it, you know, it, it was around 50% asymptomatic. So there wasn't, um, there wasn't this mythical huge number of asymptomatics that we have been hearing a lot about since then from various sources. And I don't think there's been any evidence for it since then either. So as we'll discuss in the following slides. Okay, uh, but, but this has been a consistent problem throughout the whole uh, epidemic that you are, but that is very hard to find. So. Um, on one hand, lack of testing leads to underdiagnosing, and this inflates the CFR because the more you're going to miss more of the asymptomatics than you're going to miss the people who are dying in your hands in the hospital, and the technician are going to inflate the CFR. And uh, here are two examples from Mexico and Belgium. So, you know, Mexico has a CFR more of like 15%, which is way, way too high. And this is because they're not testing. And then in Belgium, it has an even higher CFR, it's like more than 20%. And that's because early on they weren't testing, they were only testing the people in the hospitals that were severe cases. Um, so this is clearly inflated CFR. But on the other hand, uh, people are also undercounting deaths. Um, and this is very visible from this excess death statistic, which evaluates how many more people uh, have died over a given period of time than the historical average over preceding years, for example. Um, so you can generate these plots, um, so how many people in total have died uh, in, in a given region, how many people have on average died there over, say, the last five years, and you can calculate the excess deaths. And pretty much everywhere where this has been looked at, uh, there's a discrepancy, and it's in the direction of a significant number of uh, unaccounted for um, deaths, which are most likely due to COVID. Uh, so for example, this is in the United States, uh, um, this is New York, and New York had a huge spike of mortality and they diagnosed a lot of cases, but they missed like 30% you know, of them. This was even more severe in New Jersey. Um, and you can see in Arizona, so this is like up to late June or something. And you can see in Arizona, like most of the, of the deaths are probably unaccounted for at the moment. Uh, and uh, same thing in Europe. So this is Spain. There's this huge number of unaccounted deaths in Britain, uh, Netherlands, Italy. Uh, especially bad in the um, in outside of Europe and the United States. So this is like Mexico City, most of the deaths, even though Mexico is not testing enough, they're also not diagnosing enough of the deaths. You know, most of the deaths have not been accounted for. Uh, same thing in Ecuador, in Peru, and so on. So, so, you know, so we are under diagnosing the cases and we're also not counting the deaths properly. Uh, and see South Africa and Moscow and so on. So this is a problem. And the reason is that, uh, so part of it is that, you know, when people die and you have limited testing, testing resources, you know, you, you're better off testing the people who are alive and uh, for whom the diagnosis matters. So the deaths are just, the deaths are just not te being tested. But there's also a lot of political pressure to underreport deaths because if you uh, count them as pneumonia or something else, then this makes the numbers look good. And, you know, so see how well we're doing in suppressing COVID. Uh, and so I'm showing here statistics from Russia. So these are various um, Russian regions and you can see everyone is severely underreporting the deaths in certain regions by several times. Then what the real, uh, so these are the excess deaths and these are the COVID deaths. And it's a very big discrepancy. Uh, but I think this is happening everywhere. So including in the US, you know, so especially right now, a lot of states are um, if you just look at the numbers, they just don't make no sense, it's including, including California, actually. So it's way, way too low uh, relative to the cases. Um, and also, if you see things like this, um, this also indicates data faking. So this is from Kazakhstan. And actually, in Kazakhstan, they're not even, uh, they officially admitted that, you know, that the data is being manipulated pretty much 
like a month ago, but you see this plot. So you know, it's just absurd that, you know, the same number of people died every, every day. So this is just someone entering numbers into spreadsheets in complete disconnect from what actually happened. Um, and there are, there are examples like here. So this is in the United Arab Emirates. Um, so the, the deaths were going up, up, up until like the, May, the 10th of May, and then it dropped like, like a rock in one day. So magic happened. Uh, but if you compare like the cases, so, you know, the cases were going up, and then they kept going up. And then the deaths were going up with the usual um, like two week to a month lag that there is between them. And then something happened. So it might be real, you know, but I, when I see something like this, just as a data scientist, it just, it just smells. Um, so these sort of things happening everywhere. And it's difficult to tell what exactly is going on and what the real numbers are. And one last example is China. Um, so China, you know, they, uh, they truly contain the outbreak. Then they um, admitted to 1,000 deaths. And then since April, there's been only two people who have died. So like there's, two, you know, 4,632 4, and then 634. So two people have died. Meanwhile, uh, if you just look at the cases, there have been more than 2,000 new cases. So somehow they discovered some magic treatment and that pushed the IFR to 0.1%. Or whoever died since then hasn't made it for it. So you, you can, you know, you can decide which one is true. But it's happening a lot. Uh, and um, unfortunately, you know, when you have this sort of data uncertainty, it's um, uh, it's easy to tell people falsehoods and uh, distorted situations. So there was a particularly damaging preprint that came out actually from Stanford uh, in like April, where they claimed based on very poorly designed uh, antibody test based study that the CFR in Santa Clara County was 0.17%. There's no way this is true. And the reason is that if you uh, just compare the how many people of the total population have died across the world and you see places like New Jersey where we have 0.18% of the population that has died, of the total population, not, not the diagnosed cases, of the total population that have died. Uh, and in New York State it's 0.17% and it's actually more like 0 0.25, 0 0.3 for just New York City itself. Uh, and it's not the case that everyone has been infected. Um, so several prevalence in, in New York is 25% at most. So, um, you know, even if we assume the same number of people who die from the, from the rest, then at least 1% of the population is going to die. So there's no way, you know, those absurdly low IFRs that were cited are actually true uh, of like 0.17%. But you still see them being banning around um, various websites and so on, and it's very damaging. Um, and just uh, last two vignettes on this, um, probably the most reliable place in terms of uh, detection and, and data is South Korea, which has the best uh, tracing and testing program in the world pretty much. And there the CFR at the moment is 2.1%. And for it to be less than 0.2%, they would have had to miss an order of magnitude more cases than they actually detected, which Given the cotton tracing, that sounds impossible to me, and I, it's highly unlikely that's true. And then um, in Europe, Germany is the country that has the best test testing and tracing, and there the CFR is at the moment 4.3%. 4, 4 um, I think they've missed more cases than South Korea, but again, that, that, so that's why it's higher than 2.1, but uh, you know, the, probably the real number is, two, is at least 2%. Uh, and of of course, this is not static number. So this is a function of condition. So if you have top notch medical help and the best advice you, you care, maybe you can even push it down to be 1% under optimal conditions. But when your hospitals collapse and there's no treatment or there are no hospitals to begin with, then the numbers will go up dramatically because then you know people can be treated. And you see images from Peru, Bolivia, and so on, people with oxygen bottles in their cars and stuff like that. And, that's a situation in which the mortality will grow dramatically. So, um, you know, it can be even a lot worse than, than 2%. Now what it means, you know, and this is not, for some reason, this is actually not being communicated uh, properly in the media. Uh, while it's in fact a very simple calculation, you know. So if we, um, it just, you know, let's assume that 70% of the population gets infected. And you know, at, at a given IFR, if it's 0.5%, then 27 million people will die worldwide in the, and more than 1 million in the US. If it's 2%, then we're talking about 100 million dead in, in the worldwide and then 
4.5 million dead in the US, which are monstrous numbers. And, and this, is actually, this is also what the strategy of herd immunity without a vaccine means. You can achieve herd immunity with a vaccine, but herd immunity without a vaccine means that that many people will die. And it's actually, not, it's not really a strategy, it's just, uh, just let everyone die approach. That's not a solution for anything, but uh, it has been presented as a strategy, which is another uh, severe misuse of language. And right now we are, this is, as of this morning, we have 770,000 official deaths worldwide. In reality, it's probably 1 to 1 1.5 million accounting for excess deaths, and also at least 200,000, probably more like 220 in the US at the moment. And this is not the only problem though. So uh, SARS-1 wasn't something that you just contracted then didn't die and then recovered. So it left many people permanently disabled. And this article is actually from 2013. So this is way before COVID. Uh, and they were marking the 10th anniversary of SARS. And here's what they were reporting. So they were you know, following up on the survivors and uh, 40 to 50 percent of uh, the sample that they were studied were unable to return to work because of chronic overwhelming fatigue people just can't get up to do anything uh you know they have all sorts of uh, problems as i mentioned you know liver kidney um failures and so on and just there's this disabling fatigue that you know many of them feel so, so again this is 50 percent of those that survive were permanently disabled um it's not going to be 50 percent for for this virus because it's mother, but it's gonna be a significant proportion. It's probably gonna be multiples of the people who die just because that's how it works, you know. So some people die, then um, you expect a larger proportion of those that um, die to be, to have a severe condition and then many of them will be left disabled. So, so you have a disability problem and that's not being paid sufficient attention uh, according to me. And we already see these being reported, you know, for, for main patients, you know, so the chronic fatigue, the lung scanning, and the various other organ damages. And the number of those people, again, will be multiples of the, of the death. And uh, there's even more bad news. You know, if there's no lasting immunity, then um, as is the case with uh, common cold coronaviruses, for those there is no lasting immunity, and this has been confirmed experimentally, and actually many, many years before SARS. The first SARS, uh, so volunteers were infected repeatedly with OC43, and uh, within a couple of years, they lose the immunity and they catch it again. Uh, if this is the case with the new coronavirus, then we are in for a world of hurt because um, and so imagine a world in which uh, you, you contract the disease every three or four years and you have a um, one, two, three percent chance of dying from it. So that's, that's a nightmare. Uh, so now we don't know if this will be the case. It must to be seen. Um, in terms of SARS and MERS, nobody got it second time, so we don't know whether there was lasting immunity. Um, there have been numerous anecdotal reports of people testing positive in recent months um, after they have supposedly recovered, but that could have been just false negatives in between. Um, there are also many reports of antibodies dropping fast after recovery. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily a loss of immunity because memory cells can, uh, can still persist. And there's also T cell immunity. So you know, the immune system is very complicated. So we have, we have an antibody immunity, we also have a cell, cellular immunity, which is mediated by T cells. This is much more difficult to measure than, um, than antibodies. So usually people just don't measure it. Um, um, it's actually possible that um, the asymptomatics are asymptomatics because they have T cell immunity against the common cold coronaviruses. And that explains you know, the people who have very mild cases. Uh, but that shouldn't be a reason to, to cheer, you know, because uh, remember the immunity against CCCs, uh, against the coronaviruses uh, that cause the common cold doesn't last. So whatever cross immunity we have, uh, if we have it against um, COVID, uh, shouldn't be expected to last either, you know, indefinitely. So we'll see. Uh, so, so these are the best and the worst case scenarios. And it's just as general principle, one has to always consider the worst case scenario and prepare for it and plan according to it because, um, you know, better be prepared for it and then assume the things will be fine and then be caught unprepared. And the worst case scenario is again, there's no lasting immunity, then vaccines are not effective. And then the virus becomes endemic, which has already been, become endemic. And then again, everyone catches the disease every few years and, you know, some fraction dies from it. That, that's a nightmare, you know, it's like, that's a completely different word from the one we're doing right now. And, uh, 
I don't know what we're going to do. Then, second worst scenario is, which is also quite possible, is that uh, there is fasting immunity, uh, but only after one has had a bad case. So, which means you know you catch it, you are, have a mild case for some for whatever reason, but that doesn't give you a lasting immunity. And only if you spend some time in the ICU, then you get a lasting immunity. And which will generally hurt immunity, but it, it means that. Uh, on a longer term time scale, we we'll go from single digit um, mortality to double digit mortality, and that's also a nightmare. O of course, it might be that through that, you know, the i is in need low, and then even the asymptomatic infections confer immunity, or that there'll be a vaccine very soon, it will be effective, it will be pr uh, provide lifelong immunity and so on, uh, and things will be fine. So that's also possible. And there are also many possibilities in between, so we don't know what's going to happen, but again, we need to consider the worst case scenario and um, that hasn't been happening at all so far. Uh, so then just a brief uh, session on vaccines. Uh, first thing is there's never been a vaccine against coronaviruses, uh, which is partly because there's never, there never was a need for it. So common colds are mostly harmless and then SARS disappeared. Uh, but the one time this, this was attempted, which was uh, a SARS-1 vaccine, it actually caused more harm than good. So through something called AD, which is an antibody dependent enhancement. It was not in humans, it was in monkeys. Uh, it was an anecdotal, so we don't know if it's actually that's the mechanism, but that, that's what was uh, supposed to have happened. Uh, and this was abandoned after that. So, so that they didn't work very well. Of course, it was a different vaccine. So right now there are 200 different vaccines in development, many different strategies, you know, the whole world is working on it. So. So the odds are much better, but uh, that's what we have so far. Uh, and there's a from from what I'm what I've seen, there's a veterinary vaccine uh, for the few for the feline coronavirus, which actually can be 100% lethal in cats, uh, but it's described as not very effective. So which I don't know what it means, but it doesn't seem to have worked very well. And the key question is again, why there's no immunity against uh, common cold coronaviruses? So if uh, if this is because the virus itself suppresses the immune system somehow. Um, then we can expect uh, to have an effective vaccine because uh, a vaccine can be developed that doesn't involve an active virus interacting with the immune system. Uh, but if it's actually something about the molecular properties of the viral proteins, uh, so there are some scenarios you can imagine that uh, involve something like this, then the vaccine is not going to work. And, and that, that's the bad scenario. So, so we'll see what happens. Okay, uh, and also uh, just uh, people need to be aware that there's an inverse relationship between the reliability of the vaccine and how quickly it can be developed. So the ones that are front runners right now are RNA and DNA vaccines. And RNA vaccines are an experimental field. It's extremely promising because it can stimulate in principle bone, not even on animals. So, so we don't know if it's gonna work. And also, um, even if it works, it will require storage on dry eyes just because it's an RNA vaccine. And this means it would be impossible to administer very widely around the world. Um, because you, you can imagine trying to um, uh, preserve things on dry ice in Central Africa or something. It's not going to happen. Um, so that's very bad. Um, and also, a lot of the DNA vaccines which are front of us right now, they're based on adenoviruses as vectors. And there you have a problem that um, there is pre existing immunity towards the vector. So people are trying different vectors, um, even taking vectors from our species like chimps, uh, things like that, and just to, to avoid the problem of existing immunity against the vector. And this can be done for a while, but uh, you can imagine how you're going to you know, immunize the whole population once. It will develop immunity against uh, the coronavirus, but it will also develop immunity against the vector. And then if you have to do multiple rounds against the coronavirus itself, then you have to look for a new vector. So that's a... Uh, and that's also an unpleasant scenario, and it could happen. And the more robust vaccines will take much longer to develop. Uh, and then there's also the issue of administering them. So, you know, so we have a huge anti-vaxxer problem in the, in the Western world. Uh, we also have just a problem of uh, getting vaccines to people uh, in the third world. So um, I'm gonna, I'll talk about this a little bit later. And then there are treatments. Uh, so. Uh, people need to be aware that uh, there has never been an effective antiviral small molecule uh, that works as well as antibiotics. So antibiotics, especially in the, in the beginning, they were just a magic bullet, you know, you just give it to people and then they recovered and everything was fine. And here with treatment so far, we have convalescent plasma, which is isolated from patients. And that's completely impractical because it will help for special people, um, but it cannot scale well because you just cannot get it from sufficiently many people to make a difference. Then there'll be more antibodies and this will work. Uh, we know that. 
uh, and they'll be effective as prophylactics too, but they are difficult to manufacture and very expensive, and, and the implications of this are obvious. So it will be available for rich people in the West and people in Africa and so on will just have to deal with the virus. Um, um, so do not expect uh, uh, treatments to be to save everyone in the world. And so what this means is that you know we are mm, creeping towards uh, what I what I term the loss of epidemiological comfort. So it used to be that you know people would die all the time from infectious diseases just randomly as part of normal life, uh, whether it would be bacterial infections, some virus, uh, so whatever, and they would just drop and die. And over the course of the 20th century, we we have largely solved this problem, at least in, in, the, in the West. So in Africa, people still die in large numbers every year because they don't have vaccines and they don't have treatments from entirely pre preventable diseases. But, um, you know, in the West, we have antibiotics, we have mass vaccination, and this has mostly taken care of, um, of that problem. But it was being undermined by the rise of antibiotic resistance already. Uh, but it could have also been uh, shattered by the emergence of a pathogen that's difficult to treat, impossible to eradicate, and has significant mortality. And in the worst case scenario, which is again, no, no vaccine and no lasting immunity, then COVID will be that pathogen. And, and that's a very dramatic change in the world, which should have, everything should have been done to prevent it. So the only viable strategy was elimination. Um, eradicate the virus, clear it from the population, and return to normal. Uh, and this was, I say, worse because it's no longer viable anymore. So the virus has spread everywhere. Uh, and even if we have a vaccine, we're not going to be able to eradicate it because we only ever eradicated smallpox. This was in the 70s and the 70s was a different world. Right now, um, we are very close to eradicating polio, but it failed. So this is a plot of the number of polio cases by year. And you see how in the mid 2010s, we, are, we only had 22 cases in the world. And now it's going back up. And it's going back up because areas like the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, are completely lawless. And then people go, go there, try to vaccinate uh, children, and then they get, uh, they should get shot at and even killed by the people there. So it's actually impossible to get there and actually vaccinate the people. And that's why polio um, is uh, growing again and it's spreading you know, in other countries and so on. Uh, so, um, Given that you know we are moving towards having more failed states, not fewer failed states, uh, do not expect to see any uh, successful COVID eradication program in the future. So it's just going to be with us forever, and it's going to get reintroduced again and again from the countries that have it into the countries that don't. Okay. Um, so, but again, this was the only viable strategy, but it wasn't really economic perspective. But you know, if you have tens of millions of permanently disabled people, this will be a a gigantic drain on the whatever economy has allowed that to happen in its country. And that's why we're heading for. Uh, so who's going to pay disability for those people and take care of them? And what, what sort of a drag on the economy will be, as again, from a conventional economic perspective. And then also, uh, you know, if you let um, your healthcare system be overwhelmed for an extremely extended period of time, this means that uh, a major per percentage of your doctors and nurses will die because they are exposed to much higher doses of the virus and you know they'll get worse forms of the disease and virtually all of them will be need to get infected eventually and then and then you're going to have what 5 10 20 30 percent of your doctors will be uh, some combination of dead and permanently disabled and then who's going to take care of the healthcare population and what will be the economic cost of that uh, and nobody is asking these questions and I'm pretty sure that you know if you actually run the numbers again from in the same way that they have been run, you know, in those articles that I showed you before, you're gonna realize that it will be, you know, a hard walk down and elimination strategy would have been much more sensible, even economically, part to pursue than uh, what we actually did. Um, but of course, if uh, that 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 is the thinking, you know, if you are approaching the problem from the overall good, you know, of the economy in quotation marks. But um, I think something else happened, which I'll talk about in a second. And also people need to understand the absurdity of the situation. So there is no loss of real productive capital. So there's no massive natural disaster. So everything is in place, you know, factories, agricultural land is for now fine, you know, hotels, parks, you know, whatever. So everything is in place, nothing has been destroyed. You know, so in principle, there's no, there's no rational reason why uh, you cannot walk down, clear the virus, and then actually return to normal. 
um, but it wasn't done. And so why wasn't it done? And so the real measure is that if you do, a, the real issue here, I think, is that if you do a lockdown, uh, it means that uh, it, it necessitates certain things that have to happen if you do a lockdown. And they are the following. So first, a lockdown means guaranteed unemployment for much of the population, just because people are at home and they're not doing anything. So um, this means you have to take care of them somehow, because otherwise they're going to starve and you're going to have a breakdown of social order. And this is, we have observed this in your life. Uh, in quite a few places right now, uh, over the last few months. Um, so if you remember in May, in April and May, there were a lot of anti-lockdown protests and they still go on in various other places in the world. It's like there were protests in Germany recently. Uh, and this was a very common slogan, all jobs are essential. And, you know, from the perspective of the individual, they needed a essential when your physical survival depends on having a job and a cost of stream of income. And unfortunately, that's a situation in which um, a lot of people around the world um, are forced to, to exist. And so what does it, what, what does it mean? So if you, you have to take care of people and taking care of people during lockdown means first the basic income so that they can actually buy food. Um, ideally, you would actually distribute food directly if you have the infrastructure to do it and most countries don't. In China, apparently, did have it and did it. In Wuhan, and also, which is probably the most important thing, it means cancellation of debts because you have stopped the velocity of money, which means that you know I, I owe I owe my landlord or my rent. I have no no income. I cannot pay it. And then my landlord cannot pay his mortgage, and then so he goes broke. And then the bank goes broke too because uh, you know all sorts of people default on their mortgages and various other war obligations. So the whole, the whole chain of debt obligations collapses. And uh, so you cannot, uh, you cannot cancel debt for that reason. Um, but you would have to do it in a, under a real lockdown. And that was unacceptable, as we'll discuss in a second. Uh, and also you would have to place um, a lot of key industries under, gov under direct government control so that they work in the common interest. Um, for example, people, personal protective equipment manufacturing is a very obvious and uh, very pertinent area um, throughout the, the pandemic. And so we're gonna talk about this in a second too. Um, also, you cannot have an effective response towards the pandemic with a for-profit healthcare system. And in the, in the US that has been exposed in the most glaring way possible. Um, and I don't think the lessons have been learned, but um, you know you cannot you cannot tackle it with with a for-profit um, healthcare system. You have to nationalize it and run it in the in the in the common good. Uh, and also, ideally, you isolate critical infra infrastructure. So, for example, you know energy grid, uh, power plants, food production, distribution, and so on. So, you try to isolate those people so that they don't get sick, and this doesn't lead to dis to disrupt disruption in the provision of the truly vital services to society. Um, but that wasn't done either. Although so far it hasn't been a problem with my become. And again, none of this was acceptable under the current socioeconomic system. So, uh, and the reason is that in money debt, and, uh, the reason is uh, the relationship between money, debt and growth. So, so people don't really realize this, but um, because it's just a background assumption of our life, but uh, in reality money has no value, you know, if you think about it. So, especially fiat money of the kind that we use today. Uh, you can't use it for anything, and even less so when it's just numbers of screens as it is right now. Um, but uh, but what money has value as is as a claim on real resources. And real resources are uh, primary ecological productivity, which means food, uh, it's mineral resources like fossil fuels, ores, and so on, and the products of human labor. So those are the things that actually have value, and money is a claim on those on those resources. And it has value to the extent that you can actually enforce that, those claims and retrieve real um, real material goods from, from them. Um, but the problem is that, uh, you know, real resources are finite and limited and you cannot have unlimited resources on them. Um, but you can expand the claims on them infinitely. And that's a big problem. And that's, that's the heart of the matter. And the reason why we did not respond properly, um, to COVID. Um, and extremely importantly, any expansion of the economy that's not even, uh, is uh, essentially a tra transfer of wealth because the real wealth is finite and limited. We have grown the economy. Certain people have gotten more of that growth and now they have a larger claim on the, on the real resources, and, which means they've gotten richer and everyone else has gotten poor. And the key mechanism to which this is accomplished is debt because uh, you know, interest is compound, grows exponentially. 
Um, so whoever money are owed to gets richer and richer, and then whoever owes money gets poorer and poorer in relative terms. And that's not a that's a slow process. It unfolds over many decades, but it unfolds. And alternative formulation is, which was quite popular a few years ago, is in terms of uh, returns of capital exceeding growth. So, you know, if you can get your money to work for you, which means like, accumulate interest on them through various means, in terms of stocks and so on, uh, you know, you can generate much larger claims on real resources than everyone else and become much, much richer. And obviously this creates social tension because inequality is extremely damaging, you know, to uh, societal cohesion and the way to alleviate that is by pursuing growth of the economy. So the pie, pie gets bigger. So then you can paper over the cracks of inequality and keep people happy. But if the pie is not growing, then, then you, have a, you have a problem. Uh, but importantly, you know, it doesn't have to grow for the well-being you know, of the creator class because they can, as long as they have you know, a larger and larger pie of, uh, share of the pie, then from their perspective, they're good. Um, so the economy actually doesn't have to grow as long as you can avoid the collapse of the system due to social tension. And you know, this came in, in a head-on collision with the um, practical necessities of uh, dealing with the biological crisis of COVID. Um, so a lockdown would have necessitated reversing the wealth transfer. So we had a system in which, you know, through mechanisms of debt um, and, and um, accumulation of interest, you know, we are constantly transferring wealth from, from the majority of people to a very small um, oligarchic circle of people. And this would have had to stop and reverse uh, if you were to actually do a proper lockdown and eliminate the virus. Uh, because again, so we would have had to cancel that and we would have had to distribute money to people. And this was apparently unacceptable. And um, it was more acceptable to just let millions of people die. And that's what happened, I, I think, uh, in reality. And obviously, it wasn't communicated in uh, obvious um, um, explicit terms, but I think that's what happened. Uh, and um, also, there was the other issue, which was uh, placing industries under governmental control. So that would have also had to happen, but the direction in which the world has been evolving over the last 50 years has been one in which um, corporations become internationalized, globalized, and bigger and more powerful when they have more and more power over governments. And now here we would have had to actually place corporations under, uh, under governmental control. And apparently we couldn't have that either. And so we're going to pay the price in, in, in our ways. And I, in, in the articles, I cited this example, which was particularly striking. So, you know, there's the Defense Production Act under which the US president can actually force uh, businesses to work in the national interest. And actually Trump tried to force 3M, uh, which is uh, the major production, uh, producer of N95 masks in the US. So Trump tried to force them to not export masks to Canada and Mexico and other Latin American countries. And there was this very polite letter from 3M, which I'm not gonna read in, uh, in entirety, uh, telling him to, that they're just not gonna do that. Uh, they just refuse to do it. And as far as I know, they, I, I haven't seen any follow-up of this story. And I think that they just, uh, that was the end of it. So, so apparently 3M has um, more power than the US president. Um, now the one, the, the other DPA order that was, I think was followed was on, forcing uh, meatpacking plants to work even if there's uh, COVID outbreaks there. I, I think that was, that has been actually enforced, but you know, that's not in the interest of <laughs> the people working there and um, this uh, public health or anything, while this would have been, but that wasn't, you know, the corporation basically refused to do it. And this speaks a lot, you know, about the current um, uh, balance of power between governments and corporations. Uh, and then there, there's the even more most aspect of this, which is that the pandemic is an opportunity. So, in, you know, in the U.S., there was the CARES Act that was passed in late March, you know, which was essentially a giant transfer of wealth from um, from the poor to the to the rich, uh, even though the, the opposite was was needed. But apparently, there was an opportunity, and you know, um, regular people got small crops, and then trillions were given to corporations, and um, you know, that's now being used to further monopolize and consolidate the economy because um, you know, travel assets are very cheap, so they're being uh, bought up right now, left and right. And market share of uh, major corporations is increasing. And then there was also the false reopening. And, you know, and the result is, which this post that everyone has seen, so dramatic increase in cases in the US, 
he's declined recently. It's not clear whether this is uh, just their reporting issues or it's real. And then the deaths eventually are picking up again now too. So there's the lack and so on. And you know, there'll be many, many more deaths uh, in the coming months. And now, especially now that people are being forced to go to send their kids to schools. And, but meanwhile, so the, what happened to the stocks? So, so again, so the corporations were bailed out and the Fed poured trillions into the stock market. And actually the um, S&P 500 is, is at an all time high right now. It actually surpassed the high from February. You know, it went down and then right now it's higher than it has ever been. And that's even though, uh, and that's even more striking with the NASDAQ, which is the, um, yeah, so the tech, the big tech uh, index. And this has actually grown by more than a thousand points than, than the all time peak. So it's, you know, doing even better than, than before the pandemic. Uh, and meanwhile, GDP has shrunk by 30%, which is, you know, how, how can the stock market grow so much when the GDP has shrunk by 30%? That doesn't make any sense, but that's what happens when you engineer a wealth transfer um, in this way. And for comparison, you know, our countries, uh, stock markets are still quite down. So this is, this is in the UK, so th there's no recovery. Um, this is in Germany, and there's some recovery, but there the virus situation improved quite a bit too. And this is in Spain, no recovery, you know, in India, some recovery and so on, but you know, so no other country did the same uh, direct transfer, you know, of money from, from the government to the corporations. And that's why, you know, you don't see the same, the same recovery. Uh, and, you know, it didn't have to be this way. And um, uh, what many people should have realized, and I, and I, I just I realized it because I, I come from a, from a communist country and it was quite obvious to me, uh, is that uh, a communist economy actually is very well equipped to deal with such a crisis because it's on, based on debt, so there's nothing, nothing to fail, you know, in terms of uh, chains of debt obligations. Um, and people are not in danger of losing housing and employment because they, they own their housing. Uh, if they don't own it, it's owned by the government, which is not going to evict them. And all employment is guaranteed by the government. So you can walk down for however much is necessary and... Um, eradicate the virus and solve the problem. So that's entirely doable. Economies are gonna crash, you know, you're not gonna fulfill the five-year plan, but whatever. So, you know, they're not gonna crash because of that. So, um, you know, it's well equipped to deal with such a crisis. And, and indeed, you know, so right now Cuba did quite well, but they kept reintroducing the virus you know, through, you know, from, from abroad. So now they're going again, but I think they'll, uh, they'll be able to um, bring it under control again. Um, so as an example, you know how this works. But the most striking example of this is the 1972 smallpox outbreak in Yugoslavia, which is the last one in Europe. And um, just the way, the way it was dealt, it's, it's quite, quite striking. So uh, it, it appeared at the time, then immediately everything was put on a lockdown. So the Kosovo, which was the region where, where it appeared, was put on like complete lockdown. So like all roads were blocked. Um, everyone was vaccinated, 18 million people within weeks. And the whole thing was over in like a couple of months uh, or so. So uh, just showing the effectiveness of um, such a system. Um, of course, there was a vaccine at the time, but uh, you know, even with a virus that didn't have a vaccine, you know, those measures would have, would have solved the problem even for, for COVID. You know, as long as you can walk people down for sufficiently long, it will disappear. Um, uh, but you know, the world today is very different. And I just, so again, because I'm from such a country, I just want to point out that something that people don't realize. So, the greatest neoliberal de devastation uh, actually happened in Eastern Europe uh, over the last 50 years. Uh, people don't realize this. So, uh, for example, in, in Bulgaria, we have a flat 10% income tax and a flat 10% corporate tax. This was passed by the former Communist Party. And, you know, this is unthinkable even in the U.S. And you can imagine what this has done, you know, to education, to healthcare, to, to everything. I, and, you know, all advanced manufacturing, R&D, everything has been strict mined and doesn't exist anymore. Population has decreased by 30%, mostly through immigration, also through reduced life expectancy. And the healthcare, healthcare system is particularly a striking example. So normally we have universal healthcare in reality. Uh, so the National Insurance Fund is just used to leach funds off it for, through various corruption schemes. And everyone pays, pays out of pocket if they want to get treated. And you are even you are subject to direct extortion from doctors for money under the table, above the table, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and you also don't have a, any option of, of suing for malpractices in the U.S., which means that you are completely at the mercy of the doctors, and they can do whatever you know, whatever you want. And and even the governmental hospitals are actually run on a 
on a for-profit basis. Uh, and so all of those pathologies are there too. And uh, as a result, you know, many cities lost their infection disease units, their ICU units, they just don't have them at all right now. So big cities with, uh, big for Bulgaria, you know, they just have no, no such resources at all. And right now, cases are growing. And uh, so this is what happened in Bulgaria. So initially, actually kind of locked down hard and we avoided the big uh, initial spike. But then there was a reopening in May. Then this is the decline from, from the lockdown. And then, you know, it shot up dramatically. And I think there's dynamic inflation here uh, happening. There are serious reasons to think, to think that. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't have, we don't even have ICUs in many of the cities. So, um, so we expect complete disaster you know, in the coming months because of that. And then there's the question of what we can expect with the deadly virus, because this is the last zoonosis to emerge. Uh, so this, this paper is 2008, so 12 years ago, and it shows how we have been getting more and more such diseases making the jump as the years have progressed. Uh, and this is because of encroachment on wildlife, destruction of um, forests, uh, various habitats. So we come into contact with more and more such species that carry previously uh, uncontacted viruses, and they make the jump. Um, so, uh, so two um, very famous candidates for such a virus are H5N1 flu, which has a uh, mortality of 60%. So imagine, uh, imagine what such a virus would do to global population right now. So far, it's not human to human transmissible. People only get it from birds directly, but it can very easily mm, undergo those mutations and start infecting humans um, from our humans. And then, then we are, I don't know what will happen. There's also the Nipah virus, which is even more deadly. And it is human to human transmissible and has caused multiple outbreaks, but it's very serious disease. So, so far it has been contained always, it happens like in India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and so on. Um, but imagine a version, a version of that virus that has uh, similar properties to, um, to, to COVID, you know, so asymptomatic spread, but retains the high mortality. So that's entirely possible. And what are we going to do when that happens? Um, and there's also an endless variety of other germs. And um, so, so again, so uh, it's virtually guaranteed that we're gonna face a much worse pandemic in the future. And um, how are we going to deal with it? So uh, right now we, we decided to sacrifice many millions, you know, with the author of our current socioeconomic system, but uh, what are we going to do when something much worse comes along? It will, that's an open question. And then there's the larger context, which this is actually very relevant to, which is that um, anything in growth is impossible. So a dead base system has to expand uh, continuously, otherwise it will collapse under the weight of its own contradictions. Uh, but per perpetual growth is not possible. Uh, it's just physically, it's physical impossibility. The laws of physics pro prohibit it. Uh, resources are finite. Uh, so something has to give. And just as, as a general note, so the reverse is not true. So you can have uh, a pursuit of infinite growth, even if you don't have a capitalist debt-based system. Um, and that's because the ultimate cause of the pursuit of growth is just the nature of self-replicators. You know? So humans are self-replicators and just their behavior is wired to expand continuously and um, accumulate as much resources and multiply as much as possible. That has to be cautiously suppressed. So that's the, that's the real reason. But the proximal reason at the moment is capitalism and debt relationships. Uh, and that's not an absolute argument. We are actually in this situation already in the world. So, so we face a global sustainability crisis, which has multiple components, the five main ones with which are ex exhaustion of fossil fuel reserves, um, climate change, exhaustion of all other critical mineral resources on just fossil fuels. So think of phosphates, which are critical for fertilizer and all sorts of metals and just anything you can think of. Uh, and then we also deplete in renewable resources. They're renewable, but if you deplete them at a rate larger than the recharge, then they're going to get depleted. And that's true for freshwater, for topsoil. And we're also destroying ecosystems at an uh, ever accelerating space, uh, pace and driving the sixth large mass extinction in the history of the planet. And all of this is driven by the combination of uh, economic and population growth. And in each of these crises on, on its own, even if the other ones didn't exist, would have, uh, is sufficient to bring down civilization. We have all five of them interacting with each other and making each other worse in total. Uh, and, and you cannot tackle them you know, without tackling the problems of economic and population growth. And so everyone knows about climate change, you know, how, how bad it's gonna get. Um, and the most important thing though is that we actually, right now at the 
we are following the worst case scenario, which is this, you know, which you will get to 4 degrees by 2100 and it will be a nightmare. Um, but then, in, so, unfortunately, this is the only aspect of the crisis that people talk about uh, in polite company. Um, but I, I, I think actually the bigger problem is uh, ex uh, exhaustion of energy resources. So many people have heard about peak oil. Um, so what, what this graph shows is um, discovery of new oil resources over time. And as you can see, it peaked in the 1960s and he, since then he has been declining. And this is the actual production. So since around 1980, we have actually been producing more oil than we have been discovering, which means we have been drawing down on, on, our, um, inherit, on our reserves and they've been um, shrinking. And of course, oil is finite, so we don't need to know you know, even if we are discovering more and more, you know, so we know it's going to run out eventually, but uh, the point is that, you know, we are already in the, in, in the phase where we are producing more than we are discovering. Uh, and of course, this oil is also driving climate change and everything else. So we have to stop burning, burning it because of the climate situation. Um, but our more proximal problem will probably be that we just don't have enough to burn to sustain the economy. And we are rapidly approaching this point. So, um, this is conventional production in blue and then unconventional production in, in red for the world. And conventional actually peaked uh, quite a few years ago. And this has been papered over by unconventional oil like shale, but that's actually masking the reality of what's actually happening because unconventional oil has a much, much lower net energy return. And net energy is uh, the energy gain you get from how much energy you invest to get the oil out and then how much energy you get from actually burning it. And it's that difference that actually drives economic activity. Uh, and, you know, things like shale oil have abysmally low net energy returns. And uh, so net energy has been going down significantly, even though production in absolute terms has been going up. And that's why, that's also why shale oil has never been profitable, um, this is a side note. Uh, and so, you know, so essentially we are actually already on, on the downslope in terms of net energy. And, uh, and it's having consequences. So for, uh, for example, in the U.S., we have this very curious phenomenon that uh, conventional production peaked in 1971. Um, they, it has been surpassed since then with shale, but again, shale is energetically some, some looking good. So conventional oil peaked in 1971, and that's also the point since which um, uh, you know productivity. Uh, that's the point uh, after which um, you know the wealth inequality started to grow, and then the regular person stopped getting uh, his fair share of the pie, uh, to use this phrase. And many people have speculated these things are actually related because once, you know, uh, while the pie was growing, then there could be redistribution to the masses. But once it started shrinking, then mechanisms had to be put in place to stop that. And that's what we have uh, been observing, you know, since then. That's one, that's one hypothesis, you know, so we, we don't know, I don't know what's happening, but uh, it's, um, it's a coincidence uh, and might be significant coincidence. But in any case, even if it's just coincidence in this case, that's what you expect to see. So, so long term, uh, you know, as the resource pie shrinking, then it has to be divided into um, smaller and smaller chunks. And that's a big problem, um, so which we'll discuss in a second. And then there's the problem for our population, so which is politically incorrect to talk about, but it's a real problem. So, so these are the UN projections. Uh, I don't actually believe them. I think it's gonna go higher if nothing no disaster happen because these have been consistently low boiling what's actually happening. But we expect to have 10 billion people by, actually we expect to have 11 to 12 billion people by 2100. Uh, and this is a gentle swap though. So like if you pour it on a larger time scale, you know, you see this, which is, uh, which is absurd, you know, that's not sustainable, it can never be sustainable. Uh, and we don't have time to talk about this, but uh, um, because it's a complicated topic on its own, but I highly doubt that uh, we, we can have a population globally long-term sustainable that's more than a few hundred million people, but no, we can have 12 billion. And, uh, and we're also going to have a shrinking resource base. So how is the problem going to be resolved? Um, so again, the prospect of the 20th century was made possible by the fact that we were actually expanding resource use, uh, but now we have to apportion a shrinking resource base in the future, and uh, which means an, a level of uh, redistribution and cooperativity will have to be achieved. Uh, or alternatively, you you can keep things stable through brutal repression. Uh, but that's only going to work for a while. Um, and 
what's going to happen. I um, mean, most likely is that uh, civilization is going to collapse and many people are going to die. And this will, this will have, uh, this will have, um, this case consequences that people don't actually uh, appreciate and they have to appreciate. So uh, civilization collapse is a very common event throughout history. So many, many civilizations have grown, expanded, and then they have collapsed. Uh, but this has always been local. So Roman Empire collapses, that's only Southern Europe and the uh, Mediterranean. Um, but this will be global, and this is the first time it's global. It's also uh, the first collapse of an advanced technological civilization, which we've never had before. And this is qualitatively different. And the reason is that, uh, so you know, every time civilization collapses, usually you have a drastic loss of scientific knowledge and technological expertise. And those are actually our greatest evolutionary assets as a species. You know, so we, the ability to, uh, you know, understand nature and manipulate it through scientific knowledge is what. Um, you know, ensures our future survival. But we're going to lose a lot of that if civilization collapses, uh, and we're not going to recover it, most likely. And the reason is that, uh, you know, once the civilization is gone, there won't, there won't be a next one at the same level because the resources will have been dissipated. And many of those resources are, they're going to take tens, hundreds of millions of years to regenerate, or they're just not regenerable at all because they were generated uh, when um, the geology plan was very different and uh, those parts no longer operate. And this means that, uh, you know, this will place a severe cap on the level of development of future societies. Um, and, you know, for this, you know, you need to transition to a state state economy to solve this problem and you need to reduce births. Otherwise, you're going to get an involuntary increase on of deaths. Hey, um, Georgi, yes, can yeah, we... I'm, I'm, this, this is the last slide. This is the last slide, sorry. <laughs> Okay. okay. So, so this, will, this will, so you know, even without COVID, you know, this will, or pandemics, this would have required uh, uh, an imaginable level of global cooperation and uh, resource sharing, and it was never going to happen. But um, you know, just COVID kind of uh, drove it, drove the point, you know, for what was actually going to happen. You know, so um, which is that uh, you know, people are just going to be let to die. You know, that uh, seems to be very clear that that's the intention. You know, I've been wondering very for a very long how. How it will be handled in the future, and you know, COVID was a simple problem, and you know, you, you saw what happened. So, um, yeah. So I don't know what was going to happen, but uh, it doesn't look good for now. And um, that's the that's the end of the presentation. So, and thank you very much for the attention, and then I'm looking forward to the q and Wow, that was incredibly informative, and there are a lot of questions coming up. So. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a very short break. Let's try to do it short because we're we're a little short on time and do quick uh, uh, break fundraising announcement and then come back for questions. So if you want to ask a question, uh, raise your hand from the participants window and then we'll call on people in the order at which they ask. Sound good? Yep. Right. I think Gene makes some announcements. Are we skipping those in the meantime? No, go ahead, Gene. Gene, your microphone is on. Okay, let me let me let me uh, uh, do that. Just one minute. I'm sorry. Gene. We've asked to mute yourself. You're, Gene. you're un yeah. unmuted, Gene. Now yeah. I'm unmuted. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, this is certainly worth uh, an extended discussion and it returns to a number of themes that we've talked about uh, quite a bit in the past and will continue. Uh, and I'll just uh, kind of a quick report that uh, last, I promised to provide a um, slideshow that I used earlier before, as soon as I cleaned it up and it's pretty much cleaned up. So I'll try to get it out this afternoon on socialism, communism, dictatorship, the proletariat, and all that, which is intimately involved with this. But again, thank you very much. I wanted uh, two things. We need to um, go back to our, our uh, first of all, do our fund appeal. And I don't know if Richard is ready to do that. Um, yeah, I, could, I could just say a word that, um, well, thank you, thank you. The people who've already contributed, some people have contributed um, a, a second time. Um, we, 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 we have expenses, we, we're actually our expenses are, are growing a little bit. So we need help and the library needs help. 
Uh, I'll put on the uh, chat in a moment the information on how you can contribute either through PayPal or through check or cash even. Um, uh, but it's also on the email that you all received uh, from Gene announcing the meeting, the information on how to contribute. But once again, I want to thank you. Um, uh, people have and in anticipation the people who will make a contrib financial contribution. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Let me just... Maybe we can get off the uh, sharing of the... Yeah, the screen. screen. So that... Uh, uh, I don't think Georgi needs it now at this point, I assume. Uh, let me just... Uh, last thing, I just want to report uh, upcoming programs. Next week, August 23rd, drastically cutting the military budget. Why is it not a campaign issue? We're going to have Larry, Henry Lowendorf uh, from uh, Greater New Haven Peace Council. And uh, then after that, August 20, 30th, um, the past and future of US policing with noted historian and criminologist Tony Platt, who people uh, may uh, um, know. But at any rate, that's on our webpage. Please consult it and please uh, put those into your schedule. And let me turn it back to you, Alan, or um, if anybody wants to say more about that or just go on to the discussion. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started with our discussion. So if people would raise their hand, we have a couple of people who have raised their hands. Uh, let's start with Roger. And then as Roger's speaking, if you want to ask a question, it's a two minute limit. Uh, also go to the participants window and click on raise hand at the bottom and uh, we'll, we'll put you in order. And by the way, now people can unmute themselves uh, if they want to speak. But uh, like, as Alan said, please raise the hand so that we can do this in order. Thank you. Roger, Roger, yes, you wanna go yes, ahead? Yes, uh, surely. Uh, Georgie, why well, thank you for uh, an incredibly comprehensive um, presentation. And to call it comprehensive, I think it's, um, it doesn't even give it the credit that it does. It's a grand synthesis of science and, and political economy. Um, so my mind is really racing just to absorb the, the broad outlines, let alone the details. Um, I'd be interested to um, hear whether you could uh, publish this. Uh, I think it's something that um, was, is very publishable beyond the, your first article. Um, and for the library, I, I, it's really, to me, an exciting development because usually we have people reporting on stuff that has been already out there. And this is kind of what you might call breaking news and uh, both uh, in terms of the, of the news, but also in terms of the analysis. Um, so I, I'm, it's, it's a very, very exciting moment, I think. Um, I, I, I would take some um, differences on some of the concluding um, remarks, particularly about um, population. I, I think that there, the, the UN has uh, predicted a leveling off of population as, as soon as, soon as um, the end of this century, uh, or possibly at the very beginning of the next century. century. Um, and I think um, the comment that there's um, not enough resources to support that population. That would be you, Roger. <laughs> so the question is, is there a megafaunal um, animal Yes. Ever reached an abundance that humans had? Yes. No, an abundance in the tens of billions, yes. Um, and, and, and the answer, of, of course, is re it's a rhetorical question. Of course, yes. There, yes. there is none. There is none. And the, the, I don't think there has ever been. So this tells you about the, just the, how much, what the energy flows through the, through the planet can support indefinitely. Yeah. Because, uh, because, you know, so, you have to think about how you're going to feed uh, 10, 15 million people. In, in definitely, you can only feed them with the, uh, with the energy force through the system. And those are the sun and the meager geothermal that comes out of the planet's core. That's what you have. Um, you have to think about how you're going to feed those people without fossil fuels. 
Um, and we're talking about just feeding them. We're not talking about fancy electronics, gadgets, uh, big homes, all of that. You know, we're just talking about feeding. Right. We, we shouldn't, um, I, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation, particularly about which, this is, which is kind of a, not the central issue of your thesis. Um, but th those, those are empirical questions and maybe we, should, we can take them up you know, at, offline or something like that. Um, it, it is a concern, um, but the uh, data that I'm familiar with tells, tells me that the, the question of gross resources is not the problem, it's the problem of, that is inherent in a system of, of capitalism where the distribution is, is the problem. But I, I think maybe we should really let other people ask questions and, and you no, know. So, so, so I'm, very, I'm very clear that distribution, redistribution is an enormous problem, but uh, there is both the redistribution problem and the resource-based problem. Both of those are problems. And, you know, one focusing on one does not mean that, you know, you have to exclude the other. Okay, next uh, question. People, if you have any questions, raise your hand in the participants window. Next is Jean. Alan, put me on the list, please. Will do. Okay. Me, me too, Alan. Thank you. Is Mehmet, you after you already? Yes, go ahead. We can hear okay. you. Yeah, I'm concerned about this also. And uh, I appreciate your point that we are already overshot. Uh, but again, I think we need to remember the distinctive, what Engel said about the distinctive features of our species, our labor and our conceptual thought that we're capable of understanding the situation and taking appropriate action. And I think that's crucial. And I have some time ago, I wrote an article called Communism as a Human Ecological Complex, uh, Climax, and that this needs to go forward. But again, uh, it's a rocky road there. And I really appreciate this discussion. We're going to return to it uh, again and again, I'm sure. We have, uh, we did talk about uh, Planet of the Humans and we had some discussion of that and some more coming up. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I hope keep coming here. Uh, you're a valued member, I hope, of our little institute here. Thank you. Uh, Raj, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I, I think there is, uh... Um, the relationship between uh, what Roger has said, what Georgi is saying. I mean, the thing is, they're not, uh, these ideas are not apart. And that's because the very fact that once human beings are taken care of, population stops growing. We know that already from history. Okay, so the real problem is that the pattern of consumption established uh, by uh, production and uh, consumption by capitalism, it runs against the finiteness uh, of the global uh, resources. I think we have to acknowledge as Marxists, to not acknowledge there is a limit to resources is really living, you, you, you actually are abandoning Marxism. This is not, uh, so there is a limitation. What Georgi is saying is absolutely correct. There is a limitation. Now the question is how to live within that limitation. And the, the problem is, the, uh, uh, Roger's point is correct. Our resources can take care of human population and which need, need not grow. But then you have to have an economy that doesn't require it to constantly grow or fall, fall apart. And that is communism. Our, on a way to communism. So the two points are not really uh, headed to head. There's a relationship between these two. And this is why as Marx is what Engels said a hundred years ago, cannot be literally uh, translated today to say, well, no, we have abundant resources for all human beings and we keep on consuming at this rate. No, we cannot live like American middle class was told that you can live and which wasn't a good life in my opinion. I came here in 1966, I was aghast to see how wasteful the life was. And I said, how long can this last? I had to stand in line to get a little oil for the stove in India. So I just want to say that uh, as communists, we have to deny the claim of capitalists that- Two minutes. On one hand, on the other hand, we have to be realist 
about the finiteness. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, Gary, you can comment or? Yes, no, uh, so I, I very much agree about the, um, uh, just need, need, the need to f incorporate the finiteness in the in communist thinking. And then historically, that hasn't really been the case. You know? So unfortunately, um, real life communist countries relied on growth as much as capitalist countries. They didn't have to, but they did. And what well, they had to from, from geopolitical perspective, but um, so, you know, so, so historically those things have been disconnected. And yes, very much future society will be, sustainable society will be a lot more like communism than anything else, that, that is absolutely true. Uh, but also uh, one, 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 one thing I need, to, I need to comment on, so it is not the case that when people are taken care of, um, they stop uh, reproducing. So uh, the demographic transition it, this goes against mainstream thinking in, in, in the field, but um, biologically, I think that's what's actually happening. So it's not the case that people stop having kids because they, they need to taken care of. They stop taking, uh, they stop having stamen kids and they, they will have probably three or four once this is done. But the reason they go to BO2 is that uh, the cost of having kids, um, the relative cost goes, goes up much more than, than their actual affluence as, as countries industrialize because you know, just raising them properly so that they're competitive against uh, other kids needs a lot of resource and that's why they don't have a lot of kids. So it's, um, it's, it's not a positive argument um, for the demographic position, um, if that makes sense. It's a, it's a negative, it's, an, it's a negative influence that causes it. Okay, people, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Mehmet, we'll go with you next. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think Eugene and Raj uh, did uh, raise up uh, the points that I was going to make. And uh, many studies have found that, especially in France, that when workers uh, were unionized and when they were secure of their future, they really started having less and less children because they, uh, you know, the main reason for uh, having many children in the world, if you look at it, is security. And capitalism brings the biggest insecurity to people. So uh, that will take care of it. The other thing I think uh, Roger uh, went into it is that uh, we are not animals. We are humans. It means that we can decide where our future will be going. And so we do have the rationale, that we have the reasoning that if we plan our world, not this way, but the other way, then we can live a sustainable life. But our social system at this point uh, does not allow that. So the distribution, which is linked to our social system, capitalism, has to change in order to have a sustainable society. I think we all agree on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, people have questions. Oh, go ahead, Gary. You know, so, so just, just uh, so I want to comment on this because I, I kind of uh, glossed over this. So, so the system, the current system is the proximal cause of the problem. So the ultimate, the ultimate cause is, uh, is evolution. So... Uh, you, me, and everyone else is a selfish self-replicator. So we are, so the behavior is wired to maximize inclusive fitness and inclusive fitness not just direct fitness. So uh, in, this drives all human behavior and this is ultimately the reason for um, ecological unsus unsustainability. Um, so yes, you have to change the system, but you also have to account for human behavior. And, and actually that, that has been a huge gap in communist thinking, you know, that um, there's, be, there's been this, um, often incorrect understanding of human nature and just complete um, disregard for uh, the, uh, how evolution has shaped our behavior. And it's actually, you know, if you don't come for this, then whatever system you, you design is do doomed to fail. You know? So that's the, uh, this has to change, you know, as a um, just intellectual practice. You know, we have, to, we have to unify the two things. For those who have questions, go to the participants window and raise your hand. Next, we'll go to Steve. Steve, if you'll unmute. Okay, thank you. I thought it was a really good presentation. Um, I guess I have a couple of quick questions or concerns. So the, the, what I get from the presentation is that the capitalist class internationally has botched this operation. I want to make sure I have you understood correctly. Uh, and that, oh, or, and, 
Okay, and that the way it's going now is just not going to work. For the way that they are dealing with all the crises now, it's just going to be some catastrophic end. Is that what you're saying? I just want to understand what you're saying. And given that, what can the working class and activists do on survival level and on systemic level? So in terms of the capitalist class, capitalist class having botched this, uh, so that depends on what, what, uh, whose perspective and what time horizon. So from their perspective on, on a short term horizon, they executed it remar remarkably well. You know, so, uh, you know, the lockdown was avoided. They went to New Zealand, so, uh, you know, their private islands and nations and then go stay there until there's a vaccine and, you know, so they're fine. And, and they actually got richer. You know, from it. So, so from that, you know, from short, you know, they did remarkably well actually. Uh, longer term, this is suicidal, of course, and it's gonna, so from that perspective, they they failed. Uh, but short term, you know, it was it's it's very different. Now, in terms of what regular people can do, uh, um, I mean, I wish I had an answer, but I don't. I just uh, right now, you know, it's not it's not 1919 right now. It's uh, 2020 and. Um, just the level of organization that existed back then, and nowhere to be seen right now. It's a very, it's a very long road. Uh, and also you have, because you, you, um, you mentioned Adolf Freak, you know, from, from in the beginning, and also there's, there's this very powerful tool of uh, sowing division called identity politics right now. Um, and it's working remarkably well. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I have hard time seeing how, um, you know, an organized movement will arise that will um, address the problems before it's too late. Steve, did you have a follow-up uh, to that? Yeah, I, I, I do. I thank please, you for the answer. Please, go ahead. And I thank you for allowing me to have a follow-up. So what does it mean before it's too late? Give me a real life example. What does that mean? No, I mean, too late in terms of the virus. So again, so, so we don't know how bad it's going to be with the virus. You know, so I, I, I outlined some scenarios and, you know, anyone okay. who, tells you, who tells you they know what's going to happen, you know, so they're lying. Nobody knows. But uh, um, so in terms of the virus, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I suspect things are going to develop towards the worst side and towards the better. So it's going to be the extreme bad scenarios, but it's going to be bad. Uh, but the more important, uh, the, the largest scale problem is the one in the third part of my presentation, which is sustainability. And, you know, it, uh, it has, it's uh, many aspects of those, those problems are the same as with the COVID situation. And, and too late there means uh, irreversible collapse of civilization. You know, and that means, you know, again, loss of technological expertise, um, perhaps nuclear war, that's quite possible. Um, and, you know, after that, it's gonna be a very bleak future after that. And this has to be prevented at, at, at all costs, um, but I don't see how it's gonna happen. Uh, next is uh, 9307. Rich, is that you? Yes, hi, this is David by phone, thank you. I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. It's a, a speculative question, but I'll ask it anyhow. Can you think of a, a time or a fork or maybe forks in the road of our American history or economic development where we could have chosen a different path or might likely have, but it were not for some cast of characters or twist or quirk of fate? Or it, have we always been on this path, as it were? And I think Gene framed it interestingly where he said, that, I think I heard him say um, a culmination that, that Cap, or maybe it was Raj, I'm sorry, that. Um, that capital, uh, the communism rather, might well be a culmination, uh, as it were. So it would sort of put the two systems in opposition, as it were. But maybe focus on the the former the first question as uh, as a way in. Thank you. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not sure there was ever a moment. So, so, so there's the bigger question of is is history determined by individual decisions or is there a um, just general pattern that just um, unfolds, you know, irrespective of the individual. And I, I don't have an answer to this. Uh, so, you know, so the U.S. history is remarkably similar so far to that of the Roman Empire. You know, you can draw one-to-one -one parallels in many, many aspects, you know, right now. Um, just the, the way right now, for example, the authority of the state is being eroded. Um, it just closely parallels what happened during the 
the late republic um, and just the imperial overreach and all those things. So, um, so seems like it just follows the general historical pattern of rise and fall of empire. And I'm, I'm not sure there was anything anyone at some moment could have done. Uh, obviously, if certain things have been done differently, then things would have gone in a different direction. But um, whether that was a conscious decision that anyone could have made, I don't know. Okay, if anybody has questions, raise your hand. Jean, we'll go to Jean. And uh, please go to the participants window, raise your hand if you have a question, especially on the content. We, have, we haven't talked too much about some of the scientific content. Don't be intimidated. It, it, always, it always gets kicked. Go right ahead. Jean? Okay, yes, thank you. I'll give you my picture back in there. But uh, just to, to address the question of what can the working class do, um, the working class can do a lot because the working class is in power in China, Cuba, and a number of other places. So I think we have to understand these are communist countries. And I think the key thing that we as workers in the United States need to can all this China bashing that's going on. And there are some important things going on in terms of the pivot to peace with China, pivot to China. Pivot to peace. There are these websites saying, end the attack on China, the ideological attack. You know, you can accept a different view or you can start, keep, keep on spewing the uh, 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 Pompeo CIA version. But I think we need to start thinking more critically about China, Cuba, and other communist countries. And in spite of what certain people might say, they are dealing with things like ecological uh, uh, problems and uh, both China and Cuba have controlled their population growth. So I just want to say that, uh, take a closer look at China. That's what the working class needs to do. Uh, Alan, okay, put uh, me on the list for questions. So let's see. Sure. Let me, let me go ahead and ask a quick question on your presentation. I know you've, co you've commented on this several times, but maybe just to some, how optimistic do you feel about the vaccine I know you covered this in your presentation, but maybe just try to summarize how optimistic do you feel about vaccine development or treat and treatment development for that matter? Uh, so there will be there will be vaccines that uh, confer protection. The question is how long it's going to to last, and I, I don't have an answer to that. But there will be vaccines, and um, it might be the case that you know you have to take it every six months or so. But um, which you know if you have to do it, you do it. The problem is you know that that in that sort of scenario then. You know, that's not doable worldwide, you know, for 8, million, 8 billion people. But, uh, you know, I think there'll, there'll be vaccines. Um, but, you know, whether there's going to be, a, you know, sterilizing lifelong immunity vaccine, I don't know. Uh, in terms of treatments, so again, our, our record on uh, antivirus is very, very poor. Um, you know, I, I, this was just one sentence in my presentation. But uh, if you think about it, uh, we spent... Uh, 30 years of developing such drugs uh, before we could control HIV, for example. And there, there are also a couple of retrovirals that work against hepatitis C. Um, and, but again, it says control. It doesn't eradicate it. So it doesn't actually cure you. You, know, you just have to take it for the, for the rest of your life and you want to keep you alive. But that's not, that's not a cure. Uh, it's not an antibiotic. And, and, and that's the best we've ever done. Um, so you've heard about things like remdesivir, and actually it's a very attractive mechanism for a broad, broad range antiviral box replication, you know, specifically. Um, but you know, if it was effective, it would have been effective against Ebola, against everything else, and it's not. So, and that's why it only has a modest effect against SARS-CoV, SARS, uh, SARS-2. Uh, so, um, maybe, uh, given how serious the problem is there'll be a massive campaign towards um, developing small molecule drugs that will actually work. I, I mean, it's not impossible um, and probably there will be, um, but I, I wouldn't seriously bet on that because then of course you're going to place severe selective pressure on the virus towards evolving um, away from being targeted by that and you know, mm. it's going to evolve resistance. So, uh, you know, so I wouldn't bet on small molecules to save the day. Um, now treatments, so again, I mentioned monoclonal, this, this will actually work and it's, it's working right now, but that's not going to be for everyone unless we rapidly 
and massively scale of manufacturing of monoclonals. And that's not, that's not easy, can be done, but will be done, will it be done, I don't know. And again, you have the problem of the tropics, you know, how do you send antibodies, which has to be stored in minus 20 in, in, in the Central African Republic in the Sahel. So Before we go to Raj, I wanted to just, just yeah. a real quick, so would it be accurate to say that you're, I'm not sure if this is the right word, pessimistic, or you're, you're very cautious, you're saying that, look, this is not, we're not going back to quote unquote the past or to normal quickly, that a lot of that is very, is just wishful thinking. Is that accurate in your so view? We might, we might go back to normal, but it's not gonna be quick. I'm sorry, say it again? We might go back to normal, but it, it is not going to be quick. It's gonna take it's not years. Gonna be quick. Yeah. Okay, Raj? Yeah, so my question along this line is I, I see a pretty dark scenario for this, for the world, from COVID itself, much less what else you've talked about. Now, world population is about seven and a half billion, okay? 10% is 750 million, right? And 1% and is 75 million. And if the death rate is even 2%, that's 150 million, right? Mm -hmm. Yet the projections, nobody's projecting that kind of number, which means either that everybody will not be infected regardless of the fact that it is highly contagious or something else is at work. What else is at work that limits the maximum number I saw in your projection is 4% and nine, nine or 10 million worldwide. But that's a very small number compared to, that's not even, uh, that's less than half percent of the world's population. No, actually I, I listed 200 million for the 4% that. I'm sorry? I, no, I, I, I listed uh, in, in the hundreds of millions for the um, higher fatality rates. Oh, you did? I, I may yeah, have missed it. So you're saying it could be, I, so I, I, sorry about that. So 2% of the world's population is 150 million, right? So some of your projections are going as far as that? Yeah, that, that's what, uh, that, I mean, that, that, that's what the simple math shows. Um, but of course, you have to ask about the question over what time scale, because, you know, over, over the next 12 months, it's not going to be that, you know, but over the next 10 years, you know, so there uh, it takes time for, for the virus to spread. You know, th there have been a few um, puzzling cases so far, um, like, you know, you've, you've probably seen uh, the case in Sweden, which have gone down quite, quite dramatically over, over the last couple of months. Nobody knows why exactly, because they didn't, they didn't walk down, but, you know, perhaps they're socially distancing in our ways. Then there are cases like Armenia where they just opened up and, and cases also went down quite a bit. Um, but as far as I know, they are wearing masks there. So maybe, maybe it's that. Um, and so, so there are countries like that you know, around the world which are actually showing inexplicable declines right now and nobody knows. So it's possible that you know, you're hitting some, there is indeed, for example, T-cell immunity uh, pre-existing from other coronaviruses and you, know, you, you hit some, some sort of herd immunity to lower levels than expected, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the house on that. You know, just you should. Um... Well, I, I think just quickly, I think then, if World War One and Two produced two revolutions and the deaths were uh, like less than thirty million in one, seventy-five in the other, uh, then I think anything that goes over ten million is going to create a tremendous political upheaval in the world. Now, which way it will go, it's hard to say, but I don't think humanity is, is going to remain passive as all this happens, right? Mm -hmm. No, and so, I mean, it's, uh, you, you already see it. So, like, for example, in Bulgaria, they, um, so the government is going to, going to fall down soon. I uh, have, it's like, you have Belarus right now, you have several other places, you know, have erupted, and um, so there were protests in Serbia, there's protests in, like, you know, there, there's in the Lebanon, you know, so it's all over the place, you know, things are boiling, boiling over at this point already. And yeah, that, that's, that's, what, that's what will happen. Um, now, um, how it will develop, I don't know, that is, it's a chaotic system from here, you know, and difficult to, difficult to predict. Other questions, people, um, in fact, Mehmet, we only have a few more minutes. If you want to open it up, maybe if people just can, uh, we can have a little open dialogue now. We only have about five more minutes. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else or shall I ask one thing? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, following Go ahead. up on that is that 
we know there is a serious pandemic. Yes, we know. But the powers to be in the world are using that as a means of bringing down their entire control over the populations. Now that everybody is so scared, you know, people are not trusting the vaccines, but, you know, the billionaires are now into the vaccine making process. That brings up more paranoia. But then it is, uh, uh, I think, evident that all governments in the world are now putting into effect a watch, a, you know, a control, a policing over the societies using technology, but using the pandemic as the excuse. What do you think we are, uh, or where do you think we are going towards with that? Uh, there's an aspect of that, but it's, it's going to vary from place, place to place. Like, I, I don't see much of that happening in the U.S. Now, in China, uh, probably there was a big increase of surveillance from what was already a high level as a result of, uh, of the epidemic. Um, so it will vary from place to place um, and just depends on the relative power of the government. Okay. But there, uh, definitely, Kier- yes, definitely, definitely is happening. Gergi, can you make a quick comment on the Russian vaccine that was just announced? Uh, I mean, it's, so it's from, from what I know, it's a mixture of two uh, adenovirus vectors from, 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 from what I see, I might be wrong, but uh, Oh, it wasn't tested, you know, so they just, just, just this a purely political move, oh, quite obviously. Uh, can, I, uh, can I address that for real quickly? Uh, hmm? I, ju- I just sent a link from the uh, moon of Alabama. And basically what the, the link, uh, what it basically says is that the mainstream media got the whole, the whole thing about the Russian virus wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the whole thing about the vaccine, they got it totally wrong that uh, that they, uh, in, in any case, read the link and uh, and they go into a very uh, a lot of detail that basically there's no difference between what the Russians are, are doing uh, on a phase three uh, type of uh, uh, study to what we're doing, you know, here, so. Uh, okay, so, no, I mean, uh, so I haven't uh, looked too much into it. Now, in terms of the, the, the scientific approach, it's perfectly valid, you know, and it's also what uh, our people are doing. So, so it's going to work as well as uh, what several other vaccines in development are going to work. Um, maybe even better because it's like a mixture of two viruses and two vectors. So, but, you know, there's been no time to actually test in phase three. So, which, and if the reports are actually wrong, that they're going to start administering it rather than doing phase three trials, then, yeah, then there's no issue. So it was just fake news. But, um, but if they really are going to start actually giving to people without phase three, that's, that's a serious breach of um, proper practices. Other questions, comments? Jean? Chat is virtually useless because it can't no, you want to. and I can't copy it. We need to deal with the chat in some better way. Yeah, the chat, chat links don't, there's no question. Yeah. Yeah, that's, oh, well, actually, yeah. one, of the, one of the things, Gary, is that uh, I've got, we've gotten several requests for your slides. If we could, maybe if we could figure out a way, if you're, if you're willing to post them, we could put a link in, a, in the follow-up in a, uh, email yeah, awesome. on our site. Awesome. Yeah, but so I, was, I was just going to say something to know, like phase three, phase three is, is uh, going to tell you whether the vaccine is safe and it works. But given the urgency of the whole thing, it's not going to tell you anything about uh, long-term effectiveness. So, so there's a very unpleasant scenario in which um, the vaccine gets rolled out after six months of phase three trials, and then everyone gets it. And then it turns out that um, it actually makes things worse for a second infection. That's, that's like a nightmare scenario and things mm-hmm. like that. So, um, I mean, it's a low probability, but you know, you have to consider all the possibilities. And uh, so, even 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 with phase three trials, you know, we're not going to, uh, we don't have the five years ne- uh, that you know usually you would uh, fall things over, um, because you know there's just no five, there, there aren't five years to wait. So it's going to get um, rolled out and used widely without without the proper testing anyway. Uh, from whoever it comes, because it mm-hmm. just there, there are five years to wait. Other comments, <laughs> uh, Norma? Yeah, uh, just that uh, 
copying the chat as in copying that internet access uh, address uh, that uh, uh, somebody was just referring to. Ask Jean, see if you can mail back to Jean what that internet address is and Jean could mail it out to us if he would or maybe some individual that can mail to all the lists that's on this uh, uh, program today could get it and mail it to all of us because well, the, the, ch the chat is not being set up. I've asked Mehmet if he would ask Zoom or if somebody will ask Zoom how we can copy them. I have copied stuff off the chat in other meetings. We actually, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow. We'll we'll talk about. We'll get it distributed out. We'll find a way. Well, guys, uh, just a minute. Uh, you can copy from somewhere else and put it into chat. You can uh, paste it to chat. So, well, I don't know how to do that. I mean, no, I, it, you're you're going the wrong way. There's a message on chat that says, "Look at this internet connection," and we can't copy that internet connection, and we can't get it off of there before the meeting closes. When the meeting closes, the chat is gone. There right. is no more. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it, but uh, we have asked Zoom a couple of questions and it took like about a month for them to answer. But I'll I know. Ask them. Yeah. yeah, all right. Okay, uh, I think it's, uh, we're at uh, 1230. And um, I wanna, again, I wanna thank Yorgi for fantastic presentation. I think there's gonna be a lot of follow-up discussion on this. Uh, I'll take the initiative to give you an open invitation to come back anytime and talk about this topic, follow up in different aspects of it. Uh, we will do our best to get out the follow up uh, resources and um, we'll look forward to seeing people uh, next week for presentation. And um, some of you wish to stick around for a few minutes afterwards, we're gonna, we're gonna stick around, but I think we're gonna wrap up the, the actual formal presentation at this point, including the recording of the uh, of the presentation sound good thank you very much all right thank thanks, you everybody Georgie. thanks for this thanks Mehmet, georgie alan everyone that's contributed thank you mm -hmm. thank you Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Dot org.